Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was sex. And she's like, <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> Hi, welcome. <laughs> Welcome, dear uh, listeners. We'll be soon going to the podcast, so we should be saying listeners and viewers at this point, right? Okay. Welcome to Olava Talks. Um, Olava Talks. What's Olava Talks? I always kind of explain what Olava Talks is. Olava Talks is a pro project that we started about uh, earlier this year, we started in 2018, earlier this year, and the project is centered around inviting really awesome, cool, and inspiring thinkers, doers, makers, creators, activists that uh, I come across, uh, mostly in the Netherlands at this point. Uh, people who really inspire me, people with whom in conversations I find myself growing and learning and, le well, basically also sometimes developing new theories and analyses and whatnot. So I conceived of this platform as a place where we could really sort of exemplify and illustrate the power of conversation as a method of knowledge production but also of knowledge transfer. Uh, so far we invited people from all kinds of walks of life including two men actually we've had two men here ah, haven't we? We've had two men here no yes two men. Quincy Gallo no three, three. Quincy Gallo the hot one <laughs> Elvin Richters, I won't say who we think is the <laughs> because it's not that kind of show, okay, Bergson? <laughs> it's not that kind of show. <laughs> <Look at them. laughs> yeah, we're like a very serious show, we don't objectify people. Have you had environmentalists here yet? Not yet, you're the first! <laughs> so, I want to say how I know, a little bit how I know Chihiro. Um, at Chihiro, I met her the very first time when I was invited to speak at a um, climate march. At the climate march earlier this year, 2017. Oh, 2017. Yeah. Oh, you yeah, know your, like... you know your facts. <laughs> Damn it! I, I don't know shit about my own life. But in April 2017, I was invited to speak at this climate march rally, and um, they had asked me to come in and talk about, you know, and well, they didn't actually ask me anything. They just thought we're gonna invite a black person to go and speak, and I had a couple of things to say about climate racism. And that was a shocker. Uh, a lot of people from the organization were not very happy uh, with me talking, but I remember just the amount of love you ran off after I was done with the speech. You ran off and gave me a big hug and were like, you did so well! <laughs> yeah. And then we became friends! And it was more than climate racism. It was climate racism yeah. and, and, and climate and capitalism yeah. and yeah. green right is still right. Yes. <laughs> And it was like saying all the things on the stage that usually don't get said at those yeah. types of But I was very, I was very nervous because there was like I thousands know. of people. I know you were very nervous. And no one told me it was going to be thousands of people. And I was looking at their faces and imagine this sea of white people who are all like, oh, we're having a nice day at the park and being green and I start yelling about climate racism and about you know capitalism and how we need to fight all these things and I could see their faces as I was speaking I could see their faces turn into shock and into anger and a little bit of disgust you know and I could really you know how the Dutch would be like wow it was such a nice day why do you have to come and ruin this and talk about Racism where the children are here. <laughs> well, there, there was a clear divide because we must say that at there the were also, March there yeah. was the, the anti capitalist, uh, decolonial, queer, uh, feminist block. Rock? Yes. So they were like, they were losing their mind. And like they were, going, yeah, yeah, we did it. We put one of our own up there and we were, we were scoring <laughs> one for the team. But then there was this other. Tendency for of people who were like NGOs and like liberals and people yeah. who have signs that says I want to skate or Earth is the only planet with chocolate and yeah. you know don't really have a deeper analysis no. of what's going on with ecological collapse yeah. and where it's coming from and what's driving it. But that's what I mentioned. Yeah. And then I think you walked up to me and we started chatting a little bit. I had to go. And then we were like online talking, and then the next thing I invited you to come and talk at an event that I was organizing in The Hague. And there you blew me the fuck. Anyways, point is, every time I meet this woman, 
I am inspired. I feel like I've come home. I feel like I've been educated. She sends me homework. Sometimes she sends me clips of like two hours. Like watch this because you don't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I I'm always, sorry. And I always I'm watch. Sorry watching. I'm mandatory watching. I'm mandatory watching. And I do. And every time I'm like, yes, she was right. I didn't actually know what I was talking about when I said yeah. that. But it's quite an inspiration, and I'm very happy that you could make it today. Yay! Thank you. We've been trying to get to you to come here for a while. Yes. So thank you. I mean, <laughs> I also love that you also brought already homework for me. <laughs> uh, against, but we'll get to that, right? We'll discuss, we'll, we'll discuss okay, it. Yeah. Or do you want I'll, to I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a quick uh, sneak please, preview please, because, please, please, like, please. one of those things, like, when I watch something, <laughs> I want to, like, what are we going to talk about? Yeah, please, well, like, please break it down for me. Give me, give me really? a spoiler. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. I don't want yeah. But, um, I'm just thing, hoping something exciting will happen. Yeah, so climate racism and climate and decolonization will definitely be on the table. Mm -hmm. And so for that mandatory reading is Red Skin, White Masks, um, obvious play on Frantz Fanon's book. Mm -hmm. And it um, tells you a little bit more about the indigenous meets a socialist analysis of decolonial struggle. And I really should read that. Mm -hmm. um, this is the one I'm digging. We'll put this in the in the in the like the, uh, the text description of the show below the titles, huh? Just yeah. Um, this is a new book that I'm still reading. Um, it's not a light read, but it's still mandatory for mm. everyone if you want to understand fascism. And what I really appreciate about this writer is also that he actually raises the question that we need to yeah. decolonize yeah. anti-fascism. Mm -hmm. um, so more about that later. And then, if you want to do anti-empire, um, anti-imperialism, mm -hmm. you got to know your biggest empire. you got to know the foundation of uh, the United States and its genocide and the way um, that really functions mm. in the world today. Mm. Um, so I'll definitely raise some issues that are cool. um, raised by this wonderful woman, Roxanne yeah. Dunbar-Ortiz. Nice! We've got some reading to do. It's it's also around. Uh, I hate consumerism. I was about to like say like I was about to say like, this is a perfect time to buy your friends some presents. But no, let's keep that. No, don't do that. Don't buy anyone presents. Buy yourself well, a book. Okay. Yeah, but activists <laughs> also deserve some presents. For That's the time. true. Sure. 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 We're sure. always like proving ourselves and trying to be you know the biggest best versions of ourselves yeah. and improving our collective power dynamics mm. and doing so much homework so it's kind of nice when we get spoiled sometimes a little bit as well about that yeah. so about activist attitudes yeah and um these power sort of dynamics. these power dynamics, power dynamics. <laughs> see i said wait <laughs> i said the power dynamics yeah I have heard you, and we've spoken on this, we've spoken about sort of these uh, power dynamics that we inherit uh, from, that in climate, in climate justice, well not climate justice, in climate uh, 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 groupings and initiatives yeah. and activism <coughs> uh, circles and communities, um, that there are power dynamics that we inherit. Could you, could you talk to us about some of these? Sure. So, let me, so let, me, let me zoom out a little bit about who I am and what I do. Okay, what do you do? Uh, so I've been an activist. I, I started counting like my activist life since 2008. Um, before that I would go to demos or I would go to you know actions, mm. but I wouldn't be organizing and I wouldn't mm. be part of the collective. I would just be an individual showing up and I never put much, much trust in the individual as mm. a changing agent. I mean, we need to nurture our individual uh, self-care and all these things, but I believe that real change comes it's from uh, getting active and collective. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2008, I actually started in the movement against uh, war and imperialism and especially against NATO because mm -hmm. NATO had its 60 year anniversary in Strasbourg. That was that's when you started uh, actually organizing. Well, that's when I got recruited, so to speak, okay, yeah, yeah. to really go on a bus and go for a couple of days in direct action in Strasbourg when it was like a red zone, all yeah, militarized by yeah. 30,000 cops and like unions were kept at the border from Germany and. Um. 
the whole thing and that was... I mean like really sort of these very dystopian... Uh, uh, black helicopters oh, yeah, like yeah. diving over the field at night to keep you awake like these kind of torture tactics yeah. of destabilizing yeah. and um, black bloc uh, protecting the roads from you know tanks coming yeah. up and, and... But also that is all of that is, is really uh, uh, put in place to protect warmongers basically from people who are basically fighting for peace mm -hmm. i mean like these these sort of these nato officials these generals when they come together they need a whole apparatus of security around them yeah. to protect them from us yeah, yeah. You, see, <laughs> right? you see the muscle like yeah every form of oppression is backed up by military yeah like most of the time you it only is the threat of yeah. violence yeah. and that keeps people in place if you want to talk about socialization um, but this was my entry into activism so yeah. I saw the muscle mm. the, the sheer tanks water yeah. uh, water tanks um, the, the, the tear gas mm. the whole shebang mm. and I never had any illusions about you know if only we enlighten people's minds this world is going to become Shangri-La, you know, yeah. like I knew that there was a power struggle that was deeper and through time in different collectives ranging from socialist, anarchist, mm -hmm. um, spiritual groups that also want to do some humanitarian work <laughs> um, to NGOs, to semi-grassroot NGO I've been part of it, I've shopped, I've uh, been... Uh, shopped consciously. Yeah, and shopped consciously. as in like, how can I contribute? Because I like, mm. I never really belonged, Yeah. but I, I felt that there was something that I could maybe contribute in all of yeah. these movements. Yeah. But when you talk about power dynamics, it wasn't hard to see that I was usually one or mm. one of the only people of color yeah. and it's really weird how white people tend to not want to see that yeah because it doesn't matter yeah but what it really says is that you are already um, assumed assimilated <laughs> yeah assimilated yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because their whole concept of otherness, of like there being complete other cosmovisions, yeah. a complete other analysis, yeah. is ooh. and different, complete different strategies. Also, yeah. So yeah. let me give you an example. So I remember right in 2015 when there was uh, Paris, mm -hmm. the climate accord. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people on the on the way to Paris, and the big. Uh, climate UN summit which is every year so there's nothing new there and every year they pretend to do something there's a lot of greenwashing mm. this is a general no but it's also a big moment for green movements to mobilize and kind of do coalition work and united front work mm. or lobbying and pushing and media yeah. Um, but in Paris in particular there was a very sad thing that wasn't really given space the fact that that climate uh, accord is a genocide accord, yeah, yeah. and it was celebrated like yeah, exactly. Uh, not just by and the only communities were like, hold up, what the indigenous communities going like, wait a minute, why is everybody happy about this thing? Yeah, yeah. And, and and a lot of the things that were put in it were things that were already on the on the agenda in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. and in Copenhagen, it was. Um, sad it, and the accord had failed mm. because of militant uh, uh, third world countries yeah. that said this is this yeah. is genocide it's not yeah. going down yeah. whereas in Paris it was pushed through yeah. and um, where a lot of um, grassroots communities raised the issue that um, human rights have been eliminated uh -huh. uh, the indigenous people uh, demands were eliminated there's no climate debt uh -huh. or anything in it uh -huh. Uh, so what it really is, is um, an agreement or a contract between yeah. nations that doesn't put any legally binding yeah. uh, uh, strong measure in it. Yeah. It has six times the word finance in it. Yeah. Guess how many times it has the word car uh, fossil fuels in it? 
One? Guess. Don't tell me there's not one. Are you kidding me? Zero. So even if you are the most superficial climate uh, activist, how is that gonna really um, pinpoint, how is it gonna give an analysis of the yeah, problem? It doesn't, no. Because fossil fuels, as big of a problem it is, yeah. it's still a symptom. Yeah. Like underlaying is a, a, a capitalism, yeah. and underlaying capitalism is colonialism. Yeah. So if we can't even scrape the surface of saying, how does this manifest yeah. through fossil fuel industry? Yeah. How are we going to get to the dynamics of capitalist uh, politics yeah. ruling that whole uh, uh, climate summit? Or how are we going to see that colonialism? Before we get into yeah. capitalism and get into colonialism, <laughs> I, want to talk, I want to ask you a little bit about how, because um, I've heard all kinds of variations, like this is yeah. why black people, this is why POCs are not visibly involved in climate action, climate groups here in the West, yeah. predominantly, um, and in the world. And I've heard things like, oh, they just don't understand, or they don't care about these topics the way we do. Um, I have heard, uh, you know, people claim that, you know, we're just not as educated, that we don't really understand the things. And for me, like a lot of these dynamics and all these, even the reasonings people are giving are rooted in, in racism. Mm. Um, and, and also denial that the fact that the people who are fighting exactly. uh, on the front line are front line communities which yeah. are black and brown bodies, yeah. uh, communities uh, usually farm like small farmers, subsistence yeah. farmers yeah. or indigenous people who live off the land who yeah. haven't been um, um, expropriated or displaced yeah. uh, fully yet yeah. um, by capitalism and capitalism eats. Yeah. Do you think that the consciousness of that, those, mm -hmm. those relationships and those dynamics and those, um, uh, uh, you know, of racism in, in this climate initiatives as we have them in the West right now and in, in the Netherlands, do you think that there is um, a consciousness of how it works and, and how they're implicated in and how they sustain this sort of, uh, um, these sort of well, ideas about, about... One of the problems that I see is that people have been socialized to prioritize science. Mm -hmm. And science has narrow... It's a narrow container for what's quantifiable and what mm -hmm. is even researched. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I see a lot of people coming to activism through the scientific analysis of like, there's 400 parts per million of CO2, um, this is, we need to go back to 350, mm. and this is kind of climate in the air. Mm. Whereas climate on the ground, and, and that has a history going back all the way to 1896, where mm -hmm. Arrhenius was already, uh, as a scientist, mm -hmm. uh, showing that uh, fossil fuel emissions we're going to change the climate. Yeah. So often. Wow, that far back. 1896. Wow. Yeah, and but even activists that come to climate through science often only have a memory up until the 60s or the 80s, mm. which is when some white folks popularized it. Yeah. So not only is it contained by science, but it's also contained by popularizing mm. what's on TV or what's in the big books because Arrhenius wasn't a big known okay. celebrity in, okay. in, in, our, in our history. Yeah. But to me, like my, my first environmental defenders are people like Tecumse. Mm -hmm. um, not, I'm probably butchering his, his name, but he, um, he was a leader from the Shawnee mm -hmm. and he used to say that, um, well, his encounter with the white race was one of colonialism mm -hmm. and he saw how the white race was a monster yeah. and it's always hungry yeah. and what it eats is land. Yeah. So the analysis was more spiritual and much more uh, rooted in the philosophy of, of stewardship towards the earth and towards nature and like what you're doing here is not okay, not necessarily just in you know in how many uh, uh, you know how quickly the climate will change or something or how many uh, uh, carbon emissions there are but in a sort of like how looking and observing 
how I, they, the, colo the colonizer, the settler, was relating to the earth and to nature. Is that I, what you're I, I, I'm just going to make a small intervention because I wouldn't say it's more spiritual. I think that's a tendency to call indigenous people spiritual. Yeah, but I also think it's philosophical also. Like it's but I think that's yeah. just a way of the Western gaze towards mm -hmm. other cosmovisions mm -hmm. to um, diminish it to a philosophy or a, a spirituality where it's a cosmovision is bigger. It's, it's bigger than ideology or um, philosophy. It is a whole way of seeing the cosmos, of seeing okay. creation, of seeing okay. life, of what, what life means. So it definitely is spiritual, it definitely is philosophical, but I think cosmovision contains a bigger, um, a bigger, well, container again. Okay. To and and I think it it comes from a pretty uh, uh, physical analysis that when the white race came uh, to uh, the U.S., um, it broke the contract of reciprocity. Mm. I mean, indigenous people had cities. Mm. Indigenous people yeah. uh, managed forests yeah. and, and and cut down trees. It's not like they were nature sparing. I mean, they ate salmon. They weren't vegan, you know. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna have like all white vegans throwing us. Like, what do you mean? No, but I, I'm, 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 so I've been a vegetarian all my life, and I'm, I'm I feel very lucky that I've had this this lifestyle. Mm. But I think it's so hypocritical to. Um, yeah, I, I think I sure. I, I, I personally think that the, the, the way that they have in the in the West, the way they've talked about veganism in such a universal way, it's just so intellectually poor. Like I'm vegan, mm -hmm. but I am also very conscious of the relationship to animals and to nature in Burundi, where I come from, is completely different. So yeah. any of the arguments that I have about veganism in Burundi don't make sense, right? Yeah. So for example. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I'm still. Yeah, I'm still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the cosmovision is cyclical. Mm -hmm. So it's reciprocal mm -hmm. and it's cyclical. Yeah. So if I eat a salmon or if I kill a bear, I am therefore responsible for the bear population to thrive. Mm -hmm. Part of that bear becomes me, mm -hmm. and that makes me responsible for the a general welfare of the family. Mm -hmm. And so what we see both in industrialization but also in early colonialism and the total warfare on life mm. of conquering that land and total the people. Total warfare on life. Total warfare on life. That's deep, that's hard, doesn't it? No, but if we, <laughs> if we look at how the white people colonized the, the Lakota, for example, they mm. couldn't uh, do it through warfare of, of weapons mm. because the Lakota people knew the land way better. Mm. Even, even when they were outnumbered by technology, mm. um, they knew the land better. Mm. So the way they did it, they killed over a million bisons. Yeah. They, they killed the total livestock. That's war wow. on life. Yeah. That's like destroying an ecology so yeah. nothing can live on it anymore. Yeah. So you subjugate the previous stewards. Yeah by destroying the land yeah. and that that hand in hand uh, policy of destroying places and people yeah. is something i see very little in our understanding of our climate crisis that yeah. with the destruction of places comes the destruction of people yeah like yeah. going into to to shell and 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 oil abstraction yeah. you know like oil doesn't rain down no, the sky no. you know you have to it's deep deeply buried under the ground so you have to tear up the land yeah. that means tearing up the community yeah. and they're not going to let you do that without a fight so it implies yeah. again militarism warfare yeah. and, and we know this we know that that shell there's people. like that's part of the court case of going against yeah. them and there have been other court cases including, including criminal court cases against shell yeah. where we know that they would be involved in murders of activists and and so on, and sort of trying to stifle down the rebellions against mm -hmm. uh, the destruction of the Niger Delta, to just name one of the regions that have been destroyed. And I think what you're saying there about about sort of uh, this relationship of destruction to of life, um, I think can we really speak of of climate? Can we really speak of sustainability if we're not talking about reparation? If we're not talking about re like healing, because we can, right? We can actually yeah. invest money and time. 
and and create a job <laughs> around healing what we have broken, what we have destroyed. There are whole areas around the world that have been left devastated by mining, by oil extraction, and by you know, and we can actually invest it. But I never really hear about that. Yeah. So there are definitely those voices in in more radical and less radical uh, dimensions. Of one of the people that I really like is Vasiya Tavin. Mm -hmm. um, she's a, a, a another link for down. Yeah, <laughs> but the, oh, see, okay. I like you went to jail, you get links. <laughs> you get no more. Uh, we know another Duke. Um, so these people really make you rethink um, that it's not enough to to uh, do court cases using this law that we have right now because yeah. it's a it's a law that favors marketplaces and it, it, it's totally yeah. um, corporate law. Yeah, corporate law. Yeah. So and, and what does that ideology do? It says that production. Mm. is produced by uh, producing for the marketplace. Mm. So for instance, Sandana Shiva talks about this, like if you um, grow food on your in your backyard, it's not called production because no. you're feeding your own family. Yeah. But you have to have, you have to have a surplus. If, if you have a forest that provides clean air mm. and clean water and uh, a home for many species, it's not called production. But if you have a company and you go into that forest and you chop down all wood and you sell it in the marketplace, that's yeah, called production. Yeah, yeah. So the perverseness of that um, ideology, of that framework, is that destruction is production. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and what it really does is that it ex expropriates. Mm -hmm. um, we call this uh, private property, mm. but it expropriates the public good yeah. in, in favor of normalizing uh, private theft. Yeah. And, and, and so we have to radically um, change laws, yeah. because laws are the, the, mor the morality of a whole society yeah. anchored into um, into, into norms, into, into, into like norms, into yeah. actual like rules that we that are that we enforce upon each other. And I think it's interesting that you're making the connection between expropriation, the totality of the destruction of life, so this total war on life, um, this uh, production, destruction as production, mm -hmm. um, and and this sort of this hierarchy whereby private property, private theft, is the highest. And I think, and I'm curious as to how. Um, this ties into an analysis of, say, um, uh, um, of decoloniality. Like, how do we, how do we move from that what we have mm -hmm. into decolonizing? Um, uh, uh, well, not just our climate justice movements, but um, the world. You know, yeah. like, and I wonder because sometimes I think about like, what would be the what what would be the outcome of a decolonized world, decolonized. Uh, 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 global order, and I come to the conclusion that a lot of these things, the way we live our lives, would have to stop. Yeah. We would have so, to so, so one drastically, drastically, like inherently change yeah. every single the way we, we sort of what we make use of, what how we consume things, what we consume, um, how often we consume it. Even um, you know, we would have to rethink, completely restructure the way we reward people, reward the earth, and repair the earth. I mean. There's just like, would we, would it even look like this anymore, our lives? Of course not. It would not. No. I mean, one of the things we forget most, I think, is that every city um, lives above its budget. Mm. It does not live off its land. Mm. It feeds off other people's communities. Yeah. Um, the city eats uh, farmers for breakfast, you know, mm. like <laughs> it, it, it eats. Uh, land base of others yeah. and that of course that is never done without violence sometimes that violence is through corporate laws sometimes yeah. it's through IMF structural yeah. uh, SAPs uh, yeah. adjustment programs which have now been changed into another but uh, it's still going on <laughs> but the same, same thing yeah. and these these type of measures they, they can lower the life expectancy of an entire country yeah. Um, so that's deeply, deeply violent. Um, so this extractive relationship to the world and to yeah. 
in in favor of the of, of sort of the consumer in favor of the of the of the of the um, people with wealth and, and and possibility that would have to stop well it's gonna stop it's going to stop yeah oh really <laughs> i mean there's nothing about the society including our 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 self identification that is sustainable okay so of course it's not going to be sustained yeah. It's just a matter of how is that collapse going to look like? We're, we're in free fall right yeah. now. So we missed, we lost a couple of minutes of footage. This happens, this happens, this happens. So I'm going to ask you to come go back to what we were discussing. Anyway, so I want to go back. So we were, we, when, we, when the cameras, we, we weren't aware of the camera stuff, but what we were talking about had to do with what you describe as a free fall. We are in free fall. Yeah. And and how um, how you're talking about who's gonna be who's being already impacted, uh, impacted yeah. by so this free fall. That actually kind of goes back as well to our event that we did, mm -hmm. uh, where you invited me for the Hafsa uh, Salzburg Day to talk about how to move from sustainability to ecological justice. Yeah. Um, and the fact that. <sighs> Dutch or Western sustainability talk often mm. is about saving the future yeah. and it's so disrespectful to, to the all the people who are dying right now and all yeah. the people who have died already yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Um, but the free fall that we're in is that as far as I recall, scientists have already said like way back that we needed to uh, have our biggest change before uh, 2010, mm. 2015. Mm. Yeah, and now we're in 2018, yeah. and when you read the newspaper, it says we have emitted more yeah. than ever before. Oh wow! This year. Okay. So and and it says our our uh, targets, or actually the judgment of the Climate Act, mm -hmm. uh, is not achievable. Which uh, the the judge said uh, the Dutch state has to cut its emissions by 25 percent before 2020. It still wouldn't do much at this point, would it? No, and it's too little, too late. Yeah. So I also hate, like, I've, I've been in this carousel for more than 10 years, how people keep saying, it's almost too late, it's almost too late, it's yeah. almost too late. I'm like, how many chances do you think you but know, you know, the hope is a business. Is a business. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so okay. So if we can, if we can see that we've been too late for many things, mm -hmm. that we've been more than a century too late to, mm -hmm. to really cushion the blow, yeah. then it doesn't mean you, it alleviates you from doing anything. Yeah. It doesn't mean that your life is still. Um, uh, that you are as a person still should ask yourself. What is purposeful? Yeah. And yeah. I think then we really have to talk about justice. Yeah. Because we know this impact, this, this collapse is coming down. And who is going to come down on hardest? Poor people, yeah. people of color, yeah. uh, women. Like if you look at Bangladesh, uh, the, in Bangladesh it's for women, they usually don't leave the house alone, they always are accompanied by men. So also um, on, on agriculture and farming, they get left behind often when the men go to the city to do the work, mm. uh, when uh, disenfranchisement mm. happens. Yeah. So women are impacted way more in a lot of uh, yeah. communities. And if our environmental movements are not about justice, And also like what one thing that I think we, 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 we don't talk enough about is that um, migration because of climate change or climate disruption uh, or wars and so on I like, it, I, like, I like climate disruption I like it much yeah. better um, like in terms of the impact that it has on women and their families one of the things that we know about migrating women and migrating LGBT people and queer people is that they're more likely in the migration to um, they're more likely to um, experience or be the victims of sexual violence. Yeah. So you know, like it's in 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 Canada, uh, there's a lot of murdered or missing Indigenous women, yeah. and one of the signs that I um, seen one of the girls with is like they trespass our land, they trespass our bodies, like they trespass our yeah. land, yeah. and there's a whole. Um, there's a whole talk I could do about climate and misogyny, like yeah. ecocide and misogyny, and the whole um, 
philosophy of breaking boundaries, yeah. breaking boundaries of the land, breaking boundaries of women, yeah. and, and, and that in misogyny gets solidified in a practice, yeah. but it also gets solidified in a practice with ecocide. Yeah, okay. um, no, we'll come back to this. But yeah, so the impact, because I also often feel, and I think a lot of a lot of people who are involved and who are like conscious of, of sort of climate disruption and where we are at and fossil fuel extractions and mineral extractions and you know uh, mass uh, bio bio industry and all that. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are already feeling like it's too late, and that's yes. that, that, that's not that's not necessarily a a pessimistic analysis. It's just what it is, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I think a lot of it then you, because you have to just make decisions on a daily basis, you have to, you know, organize and you have to like speak out and so on. And I think a lot of times I struggle with what's the point. Yeah. But what always helps me is to remember the point is that there are people right now, yeah. right now, yeah. dying, people whose lives are being completely uprooted, yeah. people whose, um, whose, uh, communities of whether it's communities with their land and communities with the animals and whatever whose entire whose entire ecosystem that for generations for hundreds and maybe thousands of years mm -hmm. these communities have invested in are being completely destroyed yeah. um i think about it and i go like but that's why i have to do something not necessarily because i think we're gonna stop it somehow yeah. but because um i have a responsibility towards them i'm living here in europe yeah. You know, and I am the one that can go to the store and buy whatever the fuck I want. Um, I'm the one that. Can you? Well, no, I can't. <laughs> but, yeah. but you know what I mean? I, feel I don't like, know 